Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad you're here with us this morning. I'm a little loud, it sounds like. But, uh, um, my name is Quentin Schultz, and the reason I'm up here is our vacancy pastor, Pastor Schuler, came down with COVID this week. Um, thankfully, he was, felt well enough to send us a sermon on, on video, so you don't have to put up with me trying to give the sermon this morning. Um, I will be leading us through the worship service, and uh, I just want to welcome everybody that's here. Um, on last Sunday of 2023, just about ready to start the new year. Um, for those that are here, for those that are, are uh, watching us online, we thank you for being a part of our worship service. And uh, let's, uh, as the body of Christ, let's join together and, and worship and praise our God this morning. Uh, have everybody stand. We'll start with the first song. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, if you kept a record of sins, but with you there is forgiveness, then let us confess our sins to God, our Heavenly Father. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which you have ever offended you and justly deserve your punishment now and forever. But I am truly sorry for them, sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. Jesus Christ forgives us all our sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Eternal God, we commit to you your mercy and forgiveness, the year now ending, and commend to you your blessing and the love the times yet to come. In the new year, abide among us with your Holy Spirit, that we may always trust in the saving name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We'll have the first read. The first reading for today is taken from Isaiah 61, starting with the 10th verse. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and the garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet until the righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and the kings your glory. And you shall be called the new, game, new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be crowned of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem at the hand of your God. This is the word of the Lord. Be Please stand for the gospel reading from Luke 2, starting the 22nd verse. And when the time came for the purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And, his man, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen Lord Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when his parents brought in the child Jesus to proud Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and for glory to the people of Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said to him. And Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through his own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. And there was prophetess Anna, daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. And she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting the redemption of, Jer of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee and to their own town of Nazareth. Then the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Remain standing for the singing of the next hymn.
greetings to all of you in the name of Jesus. Unfortunately, I have to approach you this way because I have a case of COVID and we need to keep everybody as safe as possible. But before we begin, I want to say a word of thanks to Monica and Quentin, who've done uh, so much to help make it possible for us to still have uh, church today. Um, Monica, of course, taking care of all the details in the background, which is her speciality, and Quentin st stepping forward to uh, lead the community as we uh, celebrate this, the first Sunday after Christmas. The text for today is the Gospel lesson read earlier, with one additional verse at the beginning, uh, verse 21, which recounts the circumcision and formal giving of the name to Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The temple in Jerusalem, the center of the Jewish world, dominated the landscape of the city. It was indeed the center of Jewish religious life, a place of pilgrimage, a place of sacrifice, a place to come and meet God. For in the belief of the people of Jesus' day, this was where God dwelt on earth. That, of course, would change with Jesus. And our gospel lesson for today helps us begin to see that change happening. What we're going to focus on today are, first of all, the three small acts of piety that mark the beginning of the life of Jesus. And then we'll look at two minor characters, Simeon and Anna. Their behavior, their words, are the first marker of this change I'm talking about in how God dwells among God's people. God doesn't dwell in a building made in ha with hands. God dwells with us by coming among us in his Son, Jesus Christ. Part one, the three acts of piety that follow the birth of Jesus. On the eighth day after birth, it was the normal practice in the Jewish world for the male children to be circumcised and to be given their name formally. We've already recently heard the story of that occurring for John the Baptist. Here, in verse 21, we have a very similar story with Jesus. In this sense, John the Baptist and Jesus are in some ways the same. They are sons of the covenant. They are part of God's covenantal people. That's what the circumcision rite confirmed. Not exactly like, but somewhat like, baptism in uh, the Christian community. That additional, that additional rite, both John the Baptist and Jesus shared. But there were two additional rites for which we only have reference for Jesus. One is the presentation of Jesus in the temple. And here in our gospel lesson, we have some biblical basis for it. The firstborn was considered devoted to the Lord and needed to be bought back or redeemed. Uh, who were particularly pious, would still so practice. So this says something about Mary and Joseph. We learned earlier that Joseph was a, a person who observed the Torah. Apparently, Greetings to all of you in the name of Jesus. Unfortunately, I have to approach you this way because I have a case of COVID, and we need to keep everybody as safe as possible. But before we begin, I want to say a word of thanks to Monica and Quentin, who've done uh, so much to help make it possible for us to still have uh, church today. Um, Monica, of course, taking care of all the details in the background, which is her speciality, and Quentin st stepping forward to uh, lead the community as we uh, celebrate this, the first Sunday after Christmas. 
The text for today is the Gospel lesson, read earlier, with one additional verse at the beginning, uh, verse 21, which recounts the circumcision and formal giving of the name to Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The temple in Jerusalem, the center of the Jewish world, dominated the landscape of the city. It was, indeed, the center of Jewish religious life, a place of pilgrimage, a place of sacrifice, a place to come and meet God. For in the belief of the people of Jesus' day, this was where God dwelt on earth. That, of course, would change with Jesus. And our gospel lesson for today helps us begin to see that change happening. What we're going to focus on today are, first of all, the three small acts of piety that mark the beginning of the life of Jesus. And then we'll look at two minor characters, Simeon and Anna. Their behavior, their words, are the first marker of this change I'm talking about in how God dwells among God's people. God doesn't dwell in a building made in ha with hands. God dwells with us by coming among us in his Son, Jesus Christ. Part 1, the three acts of piety that follow the birth of Jesus. On the eighth day, after birth, it was the normal practice in the Jewish world for the male children to be circumcised and to be given their name formally. We've already recently heard the story of that occurring for John the Baptist. Here, in verse 21, we have a very similar story with Jesus. In this sense, John the Baptist and Jesus are in some ways the same. They are sons of the covenant. They are part of God's covenantal people. That's what the circumcision rite confirmed. Not exactly like, but somewhat like, baptism in uh, the Christian community. That additional, that additional rite, both John the Baptist and Jesus shared. But there were two additional rites for which we only have reference for Jesus. One is the presentation of Jesus in the temple. And here in our gospel lesson, we have some biblical basis for it. The firstborn was considered devoted to the Lord and needed to be bought back or redeemed. Um, kind of ironic here that the one who will redeem the world has to be redeemed, but that was the, the purpose for the presentation in the temple. That occurred roughly a month after the child was born and did occur in the temple. The other rite... Uh, took place several days later, and it is called the rite of purification. Because again, according to Jewish law, when a woman gives birth to a child, that woman is ritually impure, not allowed to circulate publicly, and uh, must be purified so that she can resume her normal life. Luke sort of presents these two events together in our story. Notably though, they are absent in Luke's telling of the story of John the Baptist. What's going on here? Interestingly, uh, when I did some research into this uh, presentation and purification rites, there's very little evidence of this being practiced. Apparently, had, it had fallen out of favor. But some who were particularly pious would still so practice. So this says something about Mary and Joseph. We learned earlier that Joseph was a a person who observed the Torah, apparently Joseph and Mary were very uh, concerned to do everything in the law for their son, and thus these two rites. So it demonstrates their piety. But the fact that it's in the story of Jesus, but not in the story of John the Baptist, is what we call step parallelism. Now, you probably haven't heard that term before. But it means that the second character is 
more significant than the first character. When John the Baptist came preaching, he talked about one greater than himself who would come after him. This is just Luke's way of saying that as well. Jesus is the greater one, uh, the one who comes after John, as we've used the term earlier in this preaching cycle. He is the one and only. So these three acts of piety look on one level like Mary and Joseph just doing what they believe they ought to do for their son. But on another level, they hint to us of something greater that will come from this child who bears the name Jesus. Part two, Simeon and his song. Simeon was an elderly man who apparently spent must, much of his time at the temple. As with large public buildings in any major city, even to this day, uh, those buildings tended to attract uh, people who weren't connected to other things who would sort of live around them. And Simeon seems to have been somebody like that. In other words, somebody who was homeless. Nonetheless, he's described by the gospel writer as righteous and devout, using very similar language to that which was used to describe Joseph. What's more, he's looking for the consolation of, of Israel, the kind of restoration that Isaiah talked about in the first lesson for today. But most significantly in Luke's telling is that three times in the next sentences, Luke points out how the Holy Spirit was with him. Um, the Holy Spirit was upon him, similar to the language used to describe Mary. The child was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, along with the reality that he would not taste death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he was guided by the Holy Spirit as he came into the temple. This triple emphasis on the Holy Spirit, I think, is important because throughout Luke's Gospel and Acts, it is the Spirit of God that is guiding the people of God in the new direction made possible because of the coming of Jesus Christ. Luke will make that point again and again. Um, the role of the Holy Spirit allowed for the growth of the church, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Even Jesus, at multiple occasions in the gospel, is said to be in some way influenced by the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit was upon Simeon. It was revealed to him that he would see the child, and he was guided by the Spirit into the temple. When he met the, the two, the couple, and their child, he took Jesus in his arms and he praised God. Um, interestingly, in artistic uh, portrayals of this event, Simeon is often shown holding his, lifting his eyes up to heaven to praise God. But I had a professor at the seminary who said, no, Simeon understood that this was God in his hands. He would have been looking at the child. Of course, we don't really know what his posture was, but that's an interesting perspective to think about. He took Jesus in his arms, and he praised God. Luke records the song of Simeon. It's a very simple song with just three stanzas. In the first stanza, Simeon says, you are dismissing your servant according to your word. The language here is the language used to dismiss a watchman at the end of his time of watching. You can go home now. You are relieved as the new watchman arrives. But it could also convey the idea that a watchman is no longer needed because that for which they were watching has come. 
Simeon's work is done. He can go home. That's the first part of his song. In the second part, he says, My eyes have seen your salvation prepared in the presence of all peoples. Here again is that Lucan concept of Jesus as the Savior. Simeon's eyes have seen the salvation that God will bring about in Jesus. Imagine the faith that's involved in that statement. Because Simeon had not seen Jesus as an adult, had not heard his preaching, had not seen his mighty deeds, had not followed him to Jerusalem, uh, sharing the Last Supper, present at his uh, betrayal, uh, going through his two trials, his horrible execution, and his resurrection. Simeon knew none of this specifically. But what Simeon knew is the arrival of this child met God's plan of salvation is taking place now. God's promise is fulfilled now. God is doing God's new thing now. My eyes have seen your salvation prepared in the presence of all peoples. The Jesus event is not just for the folks in Jerusalem or folks of a particular heritage. It is in the presence of all peoples. And that carries on into the third stanza where he is a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Notice Gentiles listed first and the glory of his people Israel. This is noteworthy because in the previous songs we've met in Luke, it's all been about God fulfilling his promise to the people of Israel. It advances on the song of the angels. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, very much for the Jewish people. It advances on the song of Zechariah, where God looks favorably on his chosen people and redeems them. It advances on the song of Mary, where God has helped his servant Israel according to the promise he made to Abraham. All these previous songs are about God's promise to Israel. But Simeon recognized that even more is involved here. Simeon is picking up on some of the language of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah who said that the restoration of Israel would also draw people from around the world to it. The Song of Simeon, with its three simple stanzas, is another example of step parallelism. This Jesus is more than the one that he comes after. This Jesus is the one and only. Now, the Song of Simeon, which bears the Latin title, Nunc Dimittis, from the Latin translation, we continue to use in the church in some of our evening liturgies. It's used at funerals, and it can, it's also used at some churches to mark the end of the year. And since this day happens to also be New Year's Eve, it's good to hear this song again a recognition that in what we've experienced from God, God shows that God keeps his promises, which is an assurance that God will in the future as well. Even as Simeon held the child in his arms, he knew that this tiny child would grow. What confidence to hold a ch tiny child and say, now I know it will all come true. But what's even more important is that when the child becomes a man, he's the one who will hold on to us forever with the breadth of his reach as he stretches out his arms on the cross. Part three, Anna and her witness. Anna is called in this text a prophet. 
from the tribe of Asher, an obscure subset of one of the northern tribes. She may be living or squatting in the temple. We don't really know. What we're told is she was married for seven years. And now since then, up until the age of 84, she has been active in the temple. When she encounters the child, she also praises God. But what's interesting about her praise is that the text of Luke's gospel does not use the normal word for praise. In fact, it uses a word for praising God that's not used anywhere else in the New Testament, suggesting that there was something highly unique about her praising of God. And her praise of God, and I think this may be the unique factor, was intimately linked with her practice of keeping on speaking of the child. In effect, she continues the work of the shepherds. The shepherds return, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. Anna sees the child, and she continues that work in the temple for all those who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. It's only a brief story, but it suggests, along with the story of Simeon, that an encounter with Jesus, in, in, that an encounter with Jesus has to it two parts. One, in which we recognize who Jesus is, the one who fulfills the promise of God, which we hold him as he holds us, but to which we also keep bearing witness with our words and with our lives. The complete components of the Christian life are demonstrated by these two people that most folks would avoid as they were walking through the temple, these old folks sort of hanging around on the margins, holding on to Jesus and continuing to witness about him to those looking for the redemption of Israel. Now, today, admittedly, most people don't look for the redemption of Israel. They don't use that kind of terminology. But there are so many people that are looking. So many that are looking. They may not even know that for which they are looking. But that second part of the Christian life, bearing witness to others, for which Anna is an example, is a critical part of praising in a unique way this child, Jesus. Now, the story of Simeon and Anna is only the beginning of the story of Jesus. But for Simeon and Anna, the story is accomplished. The child is here. What more do you need? And in that child is God. And we have the beginning of the shift. That God is no longer found in a building, in a particular place, constructed by human beings. God is where God is working. God is where God is working for all. God is among us in Jesus. That's the heart of the Christian message. Takeaways. The one who is coming after is greater than the one who comes before. That's clear from the rituals at the beginning. Secondly, God keeps God's promises. And you only need to see a little bit of it to know that it's true. And that is worth holding on to. And thirdly, our praise of God also involves our witness. In that way, you are true both to Simeon and Anna. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Greetings to all of you in the name of... Please rise.
as we recite the Apostles' Creed. Maybe seated. We continue with the prayers of the church. Rejoicing in the light of Christ that shines upon us, we pray for the church, the world, and all according to their needs. Each petition concludes with the word, Lord, in your mercy to which I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Blessed are you, O God, for the salvation revealed in the face of Christ. Reveal the glory of your loving presence in our congregation and fill our hearts with songs of your praise. Pour out your spirit on us as we work through the process of calling a new lead pastor. Lord, in your mercy, Blessed are you for the earth that brings forth new life in due season. Blessed are you for sun and moon, snow and fog, mountains and hills, creeping things and flying birds. Thank you, Lord, for them all. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed are you for the hope you send among the nations, especially at a time of so much war even in the land of your son's birth. Stir leaders to act with righteousness and peace so that nations will see your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed are you for coming to us in our weakness. Shower healing and hope on all for whom the future seems to hold more threat than promise. The discouraged, the weary, and the sick especially Sam, Melissa, Ron, Joan, Lee, Thora, Greg, Randy, Jenny, Kathy, Christina, Audrey, Tammy, William, Pam, Ryan, Lois, Cheryl, Bob, Sharon, Robin, Betty, Harper, Doug, Brad, Mary, and Matthew. We especially ask for your blessing of health for Pastor Schuler. Lord, please touch him with your healing hand and restore his health. Lord, we ask that you would guide the efforts of the search committee as they go through the process of identifying possible candidates for the next pastor of Luther Memorial Church. We know, Lord, that you have already determined who our next pastor will be. Guide both us and that pastor in this process so that your will be done. We ask also, Lord, that you bless Luther Memorial with your protection. We know that Satan does not want your will to be done in this ministry. We ask that you bind Satan's hands so that he cannot impede your ministry here. Also, hear the additional prayers we offer out loud or in our hearts. Thank you. 
Lord, in your mercy. Blessed are you for the children in our midst. Raise up for them faithful families, mentors, guides, and teachers, and make them joyous, healthy, and kind. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed are you for the saints. Keep us in communion with those who have gone before us until we receive our inheritance with them in light. Lord, in your mercy. Hear the hopes and prayers of our hearts, O God, and magnify our joy at the birth of your light among us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now we join in the prayer our, our, Savior, our Lord taught us to pray. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And in the incarnation of your Son, yet more wondrously restored our human nature. Grant that we may ever be alive in him, who made himself to be like us, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and grant us his peace. Amen. Please rise for the singing of the last hymn.
seated. Thank you so much, everybody, for being with us this morning. And uh, my apologies for any mistakes I made along the way. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. Uh, thank you also to Pastor Schuler for being able and willing to send the, the, the lesson sermon today. That worked out pretty well. Um, I don't know of any special announcements right now. I um, want to thank everybody that has helped out to make this service possible this morning. And a person's name doesn't get mentioned very often is Tony. He, If you're watching, if you're watching on television at home, he's a main reason why you're able to do that, and uh, I'm so thankful for that. We've we've partaken of that uh, opportunity many times. Um, I want to wish everybody a happy and blessed New Year, and look forward to seeing you here next year.